we're going to take a look at some tips and tricks uh, when programming using OpenSLES. And for these um, tricks, you're going to be looking for the OpenSLES game profile. So this code here is all that's needed to actually find out whether the uh, game profile is supported or not. It's three lines of code for if you want to copy it. If you're a game developer or an application developer, you can, you can target devices that support the OpenGL, OpenSLES game profile. And um, personally, I'm hoping that device manufacturers will actually start putting the OpenSLES logo with the profiles that they support, so that when you market your applications, you can say that it requires the OpenSLES game profile for 3D audio functionality so that the user knows to connect the two. The first thing that you want to think about is matching the audio and the video. All too often, people like to use generic audio tracks. They'll use the same track over and over again. They'll use the same track in multiple games. And it becomes rather recognizable by the user. And uh, quite a few times, I'll compare Hollywood movies with uh, games. The biggest difference when you watch a movie is that in a movie you're probably going to be watching one, two, maybe three times if it's a really good movie. When it comes to a video game on a mobile device, people are going to be playing over and over again. You don't want them to play your game just three times. You want them to play it a hundred times, two hundred times, three hundred times. You want them to keep playing it continually. You want them to tell their friends about it so they keep playing it continually. So you want to make sure that the user doesn't get bored with the audio. And that's true also for the video, of course. So you want to, even if you have a background or generic audio track, you want to modify it a little bit extra to fit the situation. You also want to make sure that you match the audio to the, the scene to get the 3D perception. Audio stimulates different senses than uh, video. Video is in the back of the brain. Audio is done on the sides of the head. And so by stimulating more of the brain, you enhance the user's perception that this is a true 3D um, experience, that it makes it more realistic for the user. Another thing is uh, to think about is that sometimes no audio is best. There are situations when you may find yourself not having any audio at all simply because it makes, makes you wonder what's going on. I don't hear anything. It adds a little bit of confusion. It can be very effective. You want to remember to vary the audio. You can vary with a few extras. You can use uh, tracks of different lengths. And this is um, one of those things that's very effective is you want to save space on your device, and you want to, you don't want to have too many things going on. So if you're using playback and you have a back a single background track that lasts uh, say lasts ten seconds, and you loop that over and over again, the user is going to recognize that really soon. But if you play an audio track that's ten seconds and an audio track that's twelve seconds, and you and then you merge the two, you're going to find that it takes quite a bit longer before those two tracks actually come back to the point where they're looping. So by simply having two tracks of different lengths, you make your background sound uh, take a lot longer before it loops. Also, when you're using a drone sound, you know, the, the common that's in the background of a lot of games, you want to use point sounds or, or specific little detail sounds. Those are what makes things a lot more realistic. So you want to break up the monotony. Another thing that you want to do is use different audio tracks for the right and left side. Some sounds are right and left specific. You can think about it. I'm using a mono microphone for this. And as I walk across the stage, you can hear that through the audio system here, the sound comes from the exact same location, even though I'm visually moving from one side to the other doesn't feel quite right, although we're trained to experience this. So uh, if somebody's using an audio system like this, you're used to hearing it. 
However, if I had a location-sensitive microphone, then the audio system in the room could actually move the audio through the system as I'm moving across the stage. Makes it a lot more realistic. One thing that you can add, if you're doing, for instance, the equalizer of depth, it's another game trick. You want to lower the 3D effect and apply a low-pass filter, and then cut the treble when the player's health is low. When our health is poor, we start losing the key perception in our senses. Our vision starts getting a little bit blurry. We start not feeling just so precise. And by reducing the clarity, you're adding that feeling of disorientation um, that the user would think. You can think of it as um, yeah, if you're really sick, you'll experience that a little bit ringing in your ears, that uh, you know, things aren't as clear, and things seem a little bit more disorienting. You can give that same effect by using um, uh, the equalizer. So uh, <clears throat> these here are the interfaces, the 3D group, the source, the Doppler, and the location interfaces. They allow you to actually control how much 3D that you're putting into the system. And by reducing the 3D and using the equalizer to uh, cut the treble, you can, add, you can get that effect to the uh, user. Another trick is to use cinematic stereo widening. We're in a big room here, a fairly large room. And again, as I'm talking, you can hear the echo. It comes off the walls, it comes off the back windows, it comes... You can hear that it's a larger room. You use cinematic stereo widening for that. And that's done using the environment with the reverb and the equalizer interfaces. Compare that to when you're in a small hallway. So when you're in a small hallway, you want to narrow the environmental reverb so that it's up close. Then when you come into a larger space, you can make the uh, player actually have the feeling of coming into a large space by changing the environmental reverb. This, this can also be added for sometimes uh, adding suspense if there's a dramatic uh, scene. You, know, you can kind of, um, you can overload the cinematic stereo widening effect because we're used to that or programmed that way from uh, cinema. So it's a great effect to have in a game. Explosions are really popular to have in games. Okay. When doing an explosion, to give the extra feeling of uh, an explosion, you can apply a bass boost effect to really enhance the boom of the explosion. And the bass boost is more than just in increasing the bass effect in the... Um, uh, it increases the um, amplitude to, so that the user really does experience this. And it, it has to do with uh, overloading various frequencies on top of each other to give you that effect that there's an additional bass. And it gives you that little bit of ringing in the ears. And uh, if you apply a low pass filter for a short time afterwards, you get the effect that you were shocked by the explosion, that your ears can lose that sensitivity that it has for a short time afterwards. So it's not just the sound, it's also the pressure wave that causes your ears to become a little bit sensitive and not pick up on the sound as much. And you can do that with a low-pass filter. Then there are engulfing sounds. And engulfing sounds are sounds that are all around us. And actually, I have to think of it, and I hadn't thought about this before, but you guys sitting out there, you can hear my voice through the audio system coming from all around you because there's speakers on the right side, there's speakers on the left side, and you really can't pinpoint where that sound's coming from. That's an engulfing sound. For me, standing up here on stage, I can hear that the sound comes from the audio system out there in the audience area, but I can't really tell if it's coming from the right to the left. It's an interesting effect. And by using the virtualizer and the equalizer interfaces, I can create that, um, like there's a crowd off in the distance. I can't tell where it is. And as I move into that, I can use these interfaces to actually think that I'm in the middle of the crowd. It's also very useful for using for uh, rain, for various weather conditions, traffic, for instance. 
And if I'm playing two different tracks with traffic, I can make the traffic actually sound like it's all around me by having uh, two tracks that I vary slightly from side to side. Because you're not, when you're in traffic or other situations, the sound isn't always coming from all, both sides. It has to do a little bit with uh, where it's coming from. Especially if you have some pinpoint sounds like a horn honking over there or uh, some tires over there. It really adds re realism to that situation. One of the best ways to make things real or sound real, or, or I shouldn't actually sound, say sound real, one of the best ways to make a scene seem real is to add point sounds. Now, I just noticed that there's carpet up here, and one of the things that I usually like to do is point out the fact that as I walk up across the stage, the stage creaks. Uh, this carpet doesn't creak yet. <laughs> but um, you can imagine, there's, there's doors opening and closing. That is a point sound. The creaking of the, of the stage is a point sound. There are lots of different point sounds that make things seem real. The great thing about point sounds, like if you have a water drop, nobody ever sees the water drop, but they hear it. And that makes things a lot more realistic. If you're in a cave, for instance, in a first player game, and there's water dropping, you don't actually have to spend the CPU or GPU cycles to create the water drop. All you have to do is use the DSP to create it. And the user will experience a much more realistic situation. And depending on which water drop sound you use, you can make it either sound cold, a really hard, cold drop, or you can create the feeling that it's warm by the slight... The sound of a water drop is different when it hits a warm surface than a cold surface. And if it's really warm, it's going to sizzle. So you can use those effects to create or uh, enhance the, um, the situational awareness of the player. For this, you're going to be using your 3D effects interfaces, the grouping, the source, the Doppler, and the location, and the effect set interface. And you're also going to be using the equalizer interface. And for this, you're going to be grouping things using the 3D group object. Another point sound is, uh, that's great to use is a bee or an insect. A, um, an insect flying around your head is also a perfect example of something that's not something that the player sees. Think about it. You know, you have flies or bees or something. They're buzzing around your head and you're looking all around. You really can't see them. But you know they're there because you can hear them. And they're really annoying. So using these interfaces, you can continually update the position of the bee. And you can vary the distance. So that, and the, uh, as you're hearing it, it changes both the um, how the player perceives it, but it changes the frequency uh, by the distance and by the speed. And the interesting thing is we hear this, but if you take a look at a beat, a beat produces a, um, a continuous frequency of somewhere between two and 400 hertz, depending on the beat. And it's continuous. They, they keep having the same frequency. But when we hear the bees, we hear them go up and down in volume, and it seems like the frequency is constantly changing. And that is the 3D effect, and that's the, what the subsystem will do for you. The problem is, though, that you can't go out and record a bee and use that, because the, you're not going to be able to record a bee flying still. A bee is constantly moving, so a bee effect is actually probably better uh, synthesized than uh, actually recorded. And then we have the classic, the good old-fashioned shotgun. In first player games, the shotgun is everybody's favorite weapon, and there's only one reason. We have been trained since childhood that guns go boom. And um, to create a shotgun, we want to use the environmental reverb to really get that big bang that the shotgun has, that, the bang that makes it everybody's favorite. So you can use the environmental reverb to vary the reverb depending on the situation and really control the sound coming out of that shotgun. If you're in a narrow hallway, it comes directly. If you're in the wide open spaces of the Wild West in the 1800s, 
you're going to hear it echo way off in the distance and then come back to you. So you can use that reverb to really get the sense that this is a powerful gun and the size of the scene at the same time. So to create the best 3D experience in your application, plan the audio at the same time you're planning the video. Don't try to add it at the end. It, uh, you want to make sure that you can actually produce the audio that you want for a specific scene. And don't overuse common audio effects. You want to stimulate as much of the brain as possible. And this is using you know, the advanced 3D effects available in OpenGLES along with the 3D effects that are available through OpenSLES so that you really stimulate the user's brain. You want to combine different sounds. And it's really important to experiment. Try different things. Try them out. See if you can make it. And marble rattle inside your coworker's head using audio. It's a lot of fun. And listen to real world examples. The, the way we really learn about audio is we go out and we listen. And most important, use the Open SLES game profile. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Extra uh, question. Yes. How do you make the sound out of the head using earphone? How do I make 3D sound using the sound out of the head using earphone? Earphone, not headphone. Okay. Um, what the ear perceives is the air front as it um, moves back and forth through the air canal. And we can use the earplugs. The earplugs don't create as good as audio as the uh, earphones do. But they, it's more of a, a frequency problem uh, than a preciseness problem. So on the higher frequency ranges, you get pretty good audio even using, if you use the higher end earbuds. Uh, but if you want a really good low bass, you do need the larger uh, headphones. But it, what produces the 3D audio effect is actually the differentiation between the right and the left ears. So that uh, you want to make sure that you control when that wavefront arrives at specific locations inside the ear. And that's what gives you the 3D location as, as far as things being in front of you, things being behind you, above, below, right, and left. So the next question is how to realize the sound step by step. Uh, coming from far to near. Uh, if the sound is coming from far to near, what is far out is really a, uh, it's generated pinpoint. But the pinpoint is really far away. Then you have a wavefront that approaches, and that wavefront is going to echo on a lot of different things on the way. And it's hard without the whole situation. For instance, if we look out the window, we have a lot of buildings up there. The sound is going to uh, bounce off of the sound is going to become clearer as it approaches you. When a sound is generated right next to your ear, it's very clear. There's very little distortion. Uh, if you have a high-end audio subsystem on the device, you don't actually have to worry about that. You just have to specify the location, the breadth of the object, and the speed at which it's um, traveling through the Doppler bit. Okay, so you have uh, created as a sound model. Yeah, company. Um, I'm actually not uh, from any company. I'm an independent. Uh, there are companies out there that have you know, developed such sound models. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, John? An effect in computer graphics and visuals called the Uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley? Yeah. It's not quite. It has to do with when you are playing a game, the simulations of the game get to a certain point in frame rate and a certain point in the evolution of the characters where you absolutely know that they're phony. Yes. And then you get past that, and then you start to get into the area of uh, disbelief or you accept it. Yeah. So that's a visual thing. Yes. So the question is, is there a similar uncanny valley in audio. There is, 
Actually, with audio, it's more of a, um, a contrast between the audio and the video that makes it believable or not believable. So that when, if the audio is more than 100 milliseconds off from the video, the, um, the listener is immediately going to know that something is wrong. Also, skips. Uh, we are much more acceptance of uh, dithering and uh, skips in video than we are in audio. As soon as you get skips in audio, you get into that uh, uncanny valley where it's not believable anymore. So skips and being out of sync are the two worst things that you can do for audio to be believable. The other thing, that audio can't be measured as far as you know, uh, audio quality index uh, 52. It doesn't work that way. It's a perception where it's up to each and every one how they perceive audio. So we, when we say about things being, um, it's audio is psychological, so it's hard to measure. And um, I would say that uh, sound, <coughs> as it becomes more and more diffused, uh, less you're less able to pinpoint where specific things are as far as audio. It, you get more and more uh, disbelief for that audio. But I wouldn't say that there's a certain point that you get to, it kind of sneaks up on you gradually. Any other questions? Yes? I just had, if you can say it over the mic, but that's a, a really good point that whether the temperature of the water has a different sound or even the temperature of air, the way that the sound resonates through it, and that's, that's interesting, something you don't think about a lot. Uh, exactly, and that, as Seth just mentioned, uh, since he's attended quite a few of these, that uh, the temperature of the air and the temperature of water, the temperature of anything changes the audio. So that, uh, for instance, if uh, the temperature is below freezing, you're going to have much less uh, humidity in the air than if the temperature is high. And that humidity is going to affect the, um, the clarity of the audio. Because the humidity will actually disperse the audio more than if you don't have the humidity. That's another way to get uh, an effect into the game that you're in a tropical forest. There's a lot of humidity or you're out in the uh, dry desert. The, uh, the sounds are going to be slightly different between the two. Anybody else? Hey, thank you.